Well, good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday, and welcome to Sunberg Farrar's virtual design conversations. This is our fifth episode, and we're so glad all of you could make it. Uh, we have an awesome lineup of speakers here for you today, and we can't wait to get started. Um, my name is Linnea Myers, and for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, I am an industrial designer, and here at Sunberg Farrar, I also help with our marketing and communications. And for anyone who doesn't know who, Sun who Sunberg Farrar is, we are a full service product innovation studio based in Detroit since 1934. And we've been serving the automotive, medical and consumer product industries um, since that time. Uh, and so before we get started here, I just wanna walk you through a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, this is called virtual design conversations for a reason. We love to keep this casual and conversational with you. Um, and so to that end, we're going to be using the chat box a lot. So if you want to go ahead and wiggle your mouse over the Zoom screen, uh, and you should see on the toolbar at the bottom a little icon that says chat, go ahead and click on that. And that's where we'll be taking all your questions and comments during uh, this time together. We love your questions, um, so please go ahead and send those at any time, um, and we will answer them as we go. Um, I'll also be using the chat to post other helpful resources and articles, um, so just you definitely don't want to miss out on that. Um, one of those articles is our event page for today, so if you ever are not sure who's up next speaking or you want to know more about the schedule, um, I will post the link to our event page in there so you can get all the information you need. Um, the other one is for an upcoming event that we have in September, which I'll talk, we, we might, I or GVAC might talk more about later. It's called Enduring Innovation and it's a design mini conference for specifically geared toward the startup and entrepreneur community. Um, and so uh, the other is our social media and um, we just have started posting all of our design talks on YouTube. So make sure to give us a like, give us a follow and never miss anything. Uh, from us. So with no further ado, I will hand it over to Jivak, who is our moderator for today. Jivak, would you like to take it away? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you again, Linnea. Uh, and thank you for all coming to our virtual design conversations. When I say coming, you're in your spare bedroom. I'm in my spare bedroom. Some of us are might be at work, but it is what it is. I cannot believe it is our fifth virtual design conversation that means five long months of COVID as such and things are changing means like even the basic questions that mankind used to ask like who we are what's our purpose now there are three basic questions people are asking first that we all know I think we all know do, do, do know, uh, know this first question when is this pandemic going to end it's a real earnest question second question following that is can you hear me can you hear me and the third is, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? It's, it's weird, but it's literally, that's the way we do. We don't say now cheers when we sign off on the email. We say, be safe. It's, it's small, incremental things, but we are seeing as, as we are becoming a little bit more mature in this last four or five months, things are changing a little bit more. There's one thing I need to do, I think, is start a protest. Help me in this kind of area. We have to go to streets and protest against having locks on the pantry door. In my house, the pantry literally is 15 feet away. Last four or five months, I was looking at what I gained. I thought it was intellectually, but I gained 15 pounds. So I do not know, but somehow there are no locks on the pantry. I, uh, it is difficult and I have two kids in the house and they have all this amazing uh, junk food lying around that sometimes I have to, I have to look in them. But talking about, uh, I would say, just uh, what's happening or how we are trying to look at things uh, and learning things. I think every time I do let uh, the folks know about what some of the things I did or most predominantly some of the books I read. This time I really want to make a, a mention, uh, uh, a note of a really wonderful book. It is, it's, the name itself is pretty amazing. A Window for a Home without walls, none other by Uday Dandavate. He is one of our designers. He actually uh, is the founder of Sonic Rim, another design studio consultancy. But my God, means I do not know. I do not know whether Uday is on this call or not, but uh, I personally enjoy poems a lot. I 
do my own poems. Uh, I uh, edit some of the old world poems as such. But uh, he did this book. Uh, he sent me uh, an email last weekend. I just sat literally early morning on my Saturday on the patio and cover to cover. I could not keep it down. Again, by the way, I'm not getting any commission on this. I really loved it. I think the reason I loved it, it might be, I did not know that's the purpose or not. But you could see the kind of design thinking in the poems too. Uh, and I could see a lot of parallels and, and typically how designers, inventors, tinkerers, maker, makers would think and then uh, kind of classified them into kind of an, uh, a pretty provocative kind of an, a good provocative kind of an uh, text uh, as such. So oh, oh, there, that's, that's a great one. I think, uh, Lanea, uh, I did send you a link. If you want to share that link uh, on the chat, people can at least explore the book uh, on the book, uh, uh, book website uh, and then they can uh, go and see if they want to uh, learn from that or, or just expand some of their mind thoughts on that. So I, I did that. I also uh, literally, uh, uh, I, I love, I think most of you know, I love Neil deGrasse Tyson. And it says uh, read for the younger minds, but it is all bite-sized and somehow that's the uh, element that's going forward with. So I bought it for my kid uh, in these COVID times just to make sure he's, apart from playing on Xbox, he's doing something meaningful. But I love astro ast astronomy and astrophysics, so that's a pretty uh, good uh, good book too. If you want to just uh, understand uh, really how many school we are and uh, and think about the context of how lucky we are still, uh, so it's it's pretty interesting. So like, trying to uh, look at the world of business, right? Q two was what it was for the industry. It was painful. Uh, things could have been better. But I think, we think at the studio of Sunbrook, or at least Q3 is going to be phenomenal. It's, it's no matter what, any design studio, any good design studio would be the canary in the mine. Uh, that's where the, uh, the triggers, the signals start. Uh, and we are seeing a tremendously good uh, flow of, of, of potential, um, not just proposals to write, but the conversations we are having. I Means enough is enough. COVID is there, we understand it, we respect it. Mask of Michigan, all those things are good. We are going to honor all those distances. But now I think we are figuring out a way, right? It means uh, if you've seen Jurassic Park, there's an amazing line over there. Life finds its way, either way, creatively, destructively, painfully, but we all find our way. And I think somehow it's not the best things we are with, but the tools that are available right now, still the communications we are doing. I'm glad this did not happen in 2000 or 1990 or something where we will literally be forced uh, to not do anything. But right now we can still, I would say, uh, commit uh, to the things that we want to commit as such. And the thing is, why we are seeing that much uh, kind of an elements, a uh, little bit more confidence in the industries. Uh, we are trying to now finally trying to unpack the elements, how customers are uh, changing their sentiments. There's, uh, I would say their sensibilities, their acceptance level of the businesses or the products uh, as such. So uh, not just the handshakes or no handshakes at all, but just the way they are okay with doing business, not just going to a restaurant, but what they are buying, essential, unessential kind of and things, which is again, a pretty deadly part too. means just down uh, on, on, on the block, uh, we have a small mall uh, and I, that's my fitness club I go to. But there are many uh, businesses there, and I happen to know almost all of them. One owns a liquor business. His sales is going through the roof. Means he, it's unbelievable that uh, of what they are doing, and uh, and it's that's what it is. I mean, in times of extreme fun or happy, you have to open up uh, the cork and bottle. Times of extreme depression or unknownness and uncertainty, people take to the bottle too, if not really, really bottle. But there is a little bit more free flowing things uh, as such. And he told me, like, people tell him, like, hey, uh, this is not my coffee cup, but if I have my coffee cup in hand, people don't know what's inside it. You don't smell uh, through Zoom meetings what the other person is having uh, or maybe not having. So his business is doing good, but adjoining wall is cleaners. I, I use those cleaners. But literally, uh, his business is about to close his business. It will be so sad, but it's the last four months, five months, we are not. And so I just broke out this jacket because I just felt like wearing, but I'm not using, I'm not uh, giving my uh, laundry out for pressing in this last four or five months. I have literally wardrobes full of uh, things that are still pretty good to go with. So some businesses are completely taken in a different way. I mean, it's the only business he's getting is 
cleaning uh, comforters and uh, those things maybe for for the winter months but that's it nothing else so there are different elements like the like fitness world we are trying to talk with a, a fitness company as such when some of their products are flying off the shelf back order for at least more six seven months as such it's they do not know how to cope up with demand uh, and like it's it's uh, it's happening in plenty of other businesses too but i think yesterday we were talking with another uh, amazing gentleman uh, from from california he's from earth kind they do pest control and the element that uh, he said his name was john uh, his name is john not was like more and pe- more and more people are working from homes and not just through the window you are seeing how the nature of the birds uh, bloomed in the spring but now since you are home you are seeing all these ladybugs and critters and chloras around that normally you will never see inside because you are so stressed you are always coming back and forth from work you you only see them what you need to see but now you are literally looking at everything and spiders and moths uh, rats and mice and all those things which might be even infesting the things that are closed right we're talking about schools like schools are closed right now but for mice or rats i don't know what's uh, are they having a pretty merry time over there so things different are changing and then again coming back how those things will evolve and have to anticipate those things are pretty uh, pretty interesting and important but one thing is for sure i know uh, i see peter already there and we will start in a couple of minutes uh, as such with our first speaker but one thing we have to ask to each other and make sure we are really cognizant of this is next year or after 6 months or after 4 months uh, hopefully people are not going to ask what was covid what was this what was that they are going to ask you what did you do in this time what did you accomplish in this time not the everyday work things not the everyday uh, uh, i would say a job kind of a thing but what extra you did because we literally have time means there is no doubt everybody has more time we are not doing all the things that we had uh, back to back to back so i think we all should look about not just our maybe a new vegetable gardening box or maybe a, a newer kind of and way to build a, a play fort or something but even in your work even in your work what programs are you initiating how are you trying to look at the newer world with the tools you have if you are in that industry what would be the industry needs and how you are trying to decipher uh, these kind of anti leaves uh, uh, that are happening right now and how you go forward so i think we all should be cognizant about that question next year when uh, now nowadays we are going to ask simple questions to our speakers but starting next year it will be like what was the biggest thing uh, that happened and maybe we can start with with some of the uh, some of the speakers over here so uh coming back to uh, uh after this personal musings i would say uh, we should start uh, uh with our speakers we have four amazingly hand picked distinguished speakers who are here to share their journey this is not going to be a uh, boring business kind of a undis- uh, dis- uh, discussion is going to be conversation it's literally like eventually they are going to share some of their elements from uh, from the journey keep on asking their questions to the chat if appropriate we can uh, I, i can i can uh, jump in and ask questions right there and there but after the sessions after their say their presentations are done maybe 20 25 minutes uh, per head make sure uh, ask the questions uh, that you have we will try to get them answered if not we'll try to make sure uh, we reach out to them and get those questions answered and complete the loop back uh, in our uh, let's say feedback time so without further ado uh, pete i see you there can you unmute and un- un- video or on video yourself i have shared my screen can you hear me <laughs> can I you can see me? hear you uh, we cannot see you uh, i can see the screen if you want if you are okay you can uh, have your video on too so people can there you go hello <laughs> pete how are you hi how you doing pretty good pretty good uh, and for the folks who are on the zoom seminar there is a bar uh, between the video and between the screens you can take it left to right to see whether you want to see the dinosaur or you want to see pete uh, but right now let's look at pete how are you doing man it's how is life been in las vegas uh, it's good it's a little hot at the moment we're in a heat wave so it's i think it's about 113 today so it's a little on the hot side and of course um the minute this started someone started um uh working on their yard outside so you'll probably hear this sort of machine going off and there's nothing i can do about that <laughs> you can you can't help that you can just throw a throw a water <laughs> bottle at him nothing more than that but um but now everything's good everything good with you Oh pretty good pretty good I think I need to take some uh, fashion lessons from you I love your frame that 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 uh, glass eye glass frame that that that's literally is pretty amazing it really adds color to uh, color to uh, the entire element I I 
I was going to ask a couple of things, but I already see some of some amazing uh, instruments behind you. Tell me about that. What's is that? What you do for fun? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been a musician for uh, way longer than I care to admit, uh, nearly forty years. So I, I play a lot, and I, I I was a session musician briefly before I went to uh, college to study chemistry. So and I actually made all I paid for college by being a musician. So I've been a musician for years. I think I think I think if we have time at the end back end, we should spare a couple of minutes for you to grab one of those babies and just show us show us what it is. I, I love the uh, the uh, the one with the British flag on it. That's pretty interesting. We were we were just talking about uh, the 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 music. I think uh, Len I was playing the music of Newton uh, Faulkner, uh, and that was pretty peppy. And I was talking about uh, the number one musician I love, and I might be his hands down Queen. And somehow when I was raised up back in India, uh, we had a pretty lots of strong influence uh, from his music and just uh, love the way he puts his energy and passion into it. Okay, so uh, should we, uh, I, I, I see your slides. Uh, I'm, I'm just really, really curious to just understand uh, the perspectives from you. So uh, let's do one thing. Let's, uh, let, uh, I will allow you to roll. Uh, let's look at this amazing T-Rex over there. And then uh, at the back end, uh, we will try to have a conversation about about dinosaurs, killers, and winners. It's, it's all over to you, Pete. And uh, I'm I'm closer to Freddie Mercury than I am to Wagner in, in so many ways. But um, but uh, yeah, let, let's let's start with this. And uh, yeah, I'll try and keep this uh, as interesting as I can. But dinosaur killers and winners. What? Why am I talking about dinosaurs in the middle of uh, uh, a COVID disaster? Um, and, and the reason for this is my my background is that I apply. Um, psychology to um, business problems a whole different range of i've got problems with this slide jumping ahead but uh, i apply psychology to um, business problems and innovation and creativity and try and look at how the mind works and can can understand in the mind unlock ways to be more efficient in in innovation and one of the one of the very basics uh, i found when i first started looking at innovation is how do people deal with new situations and new information? And we really have two ways of doing that. I mean, it, uh, like a lot of psychology, this is kind of obvious and common sense. But, but when we, we come across a new situation, we do one of two things. We either look for um, similar situations that have happened in the past. So when it comes to COVID-19, um, the obvious one is, has there been a pandemic in the past? And yes, there has. There was one back in 1918 and 1919 after the First World War. And if you look back at that, you see a picture of it there. And certainly we can learn from things from that. In fact, if you look, there's a bunch of people wearing masks and, you know, it took uh, the WHO and the CDC three or four months to work out that masks were a good idea. So we could have, you know, looked back, and it's still taking some people some time to work it out now. So there, there are some obvious sort of benefits for looking back to similar situations. And, and likewise, we had a, a more recent viral outbreak with SARS, so, and there were things we can learn from that because we actually stopped SARS quite effectively. But clearly, um, the problem with similarity, and, and we come across this when we're designing or innovating all the time, is it's very rare that we come across a situation which is new, um, but is also exactly the same as in the past. That doesn't make sense. So, so very rarely does similarity have all of the answers for us. So what we naturally do as humans then is we look for analogies. We look for similar situations, things that are structurally similar, but that aren't identical that we can still learn from. So, you know, I'll give you an example. Not that long ago, I was working on a problem on supply chain and we couldn't find a, a, a sufficiently similar example to fix it. We ended up fixing it by looking at a, a mixture of flow dynamics, which is a principle from physics, but it's how does something flow through pipelines, which is somewhat similar to um, uh, a supply chain and we also looked at slime mold i won't go into that but we took ideas from other areas that weren't literally similar but were structurally similar and applied to them so when it came to COVID, i started thinking well what are some situations um, where we've faced big disasters in the past? And then I got to think, well, what's the biggest disaster in the history of the planet? And arguably, it was when the comet hit the Earth and wiped out the dinosaurs, because that was quite a big one. So I started digging into that and thinking, is there anything we can learn from it? And I think there is. I mean, clearly, 
I hope the situation that we're facing is not quite as big as this and it's not a, a species killer because otherwise we've got bigger problems and your question as to what were you doing during COVID is going to be somewhat irrelevant. But, um, but hopefully it doesn't get to that. But I do think if we look at it from a structural point of view, there are some things we can learn. Now, just a word on psychology. I don't want to get too deep into this, but I, I think psychology is fascinating and so important for those of us who work in innovative and creative fields. And, and that's because, you know, creativity, it all comes from the mind. And a lot of the time what we do is intuitive. But, um, you know, like with any tool, the mind is a tool. And the more you understand about how a tool works, often the better you can use it. And psychology is really sort of how do we understand at, at the tool we have, that brilliant tool, which is our mind. And I got into this about 15 years ago. It's become more mainstream recently. But, you know, psychology has been for, you know, 100 years and certainly for 50 years has been doing a lot of really great work in understanding how we think. Um, behavioral economics and cognitive psychology is really uh, understanding how we make decisions and what decisions we make. Memory science, visual science, perceptual science is understanding what we pay attention to and what we see. You know, evolutionary psychology is what are our basic motivations sort of made in and succeeding and socializing. And those insights have been around for a long time and continue to grow, but often they're done in very, in very academic fields, so they don't translate into um, useful or commercially viable insights. So, so what I try and do is take those insights and convert them into something which is, which is useful without having to read 25 really boring papers on psychology. But to, to that point, why, does, why is an analogy useful? Well, an analogy is only useful if you dig below the surface because it's not literally similar. You've got to look at the structure. So if you look at the structure of what happened when that meteorite um, hit the Earth, what, what actually went on? Well, the first thing is, is that the world changed. Um, it smashed into the earth. If you happen to be sitting, a dinosaur sitting underneath it, you were vaporized. So obviously the, the world changed quite dramatically for you. But all across the planet, dust and rocks and heat was spewed up into the atmosphere and, and it became dark for a period of time. So the context changed for the whole world. And that's somewhat similar to COVID because not everybody has caught COVID, but the, the collateral damage from it is in, impacting everyone. What then happened is species started to die off. Um, first of all, plants died off because without light, plants don't do terribly well. Um, but after, after the plants died off, the next thing that happens is the, um, the herbivores started to die off because they didn't have anything to eat. To eat sorry. And then after that, eventually, um, the predators started to die off because with no herbivores to eat, they had nothing. So what we saw was the network breakdown. You see die off initially with a couple of species, but that has knock on effects on everything else. And you know, the competition between species, supply chains and alliances all change. And I think we're gonna see a lot of this play out more and more as COVID goes down. I mean, I live in Las Vegas. Um, I'm very closely connected to the entertainment industry and the hospitality industry. And we're already seeing some massive changes or die out there. Um, Cirque du Soleil declared bankruptcy about two weeks ago, and that's a massive company. Um, Virgin Atlantic declared bankruptcy, I think, at the back end of last week. And that obviously is going to affect those companies, but it's also going to affect a whole bunch of others. We're going to have that same knock-on effect because, you know, without Virgin flying people into Vegas or the rest of the U.S., that impacts hotels, hospi um, hotels um, casinos, restaurants, all sorts of things. So we're seeing a similar sort of network effect play out. Now, um, what does that mean? Well, you know, it's interesting that you see the parallels, but what where analogies are really useful is if you can see insights from what happened that can help you to navigate the problem. And in the case of the dinosaur killer, kind of four types of species survived. And that's, that's what gets interesting because can we learn anything from them? So the first thing is, is some species evolved. So we think the dinosaurs died out. They kind of did and they kind of didn't. Birds are around today and birds have a lot of dinosaur D DNA. So, um, uh, in some senses, at least the genes of dinosaurs survived. And we're going to see something like that. Cirque du Soleil has gone into bankruptcy. It's not going to disappear. It's going to come out of bankruptcy at the, end, at the end, but it's going to look different. How different? Who knows? But, you know, it's going to be, in some extent, to some extent, it's going to go through a transition like birds to dinosaurs. Some things survived in niches. Um, you know, sharks 
are basically a living fossil. They were around at the time of dinosaurs. They're still there. And they're still around because they were just bloody good at what they did. Um, you know, sharks are killing machines. They don't bother about a lot of other stuff. They just kill very efficiently. And I'm sure they're, you know, um, they, they died off to some extent, but just because they were damn good at what they did, they're still around. There's a third type, which didn't occur that much during the um, dinosaur killer uh, event, but some things are just too big to fail. But, you know, a few giant redwoods survived. And part of that is because they're big, they, they store tons of resources, and they were able to weather out the storm. But by far the most interesting of the, the species that survived was us, and, and, and that's mammals. And there's this flashy name for this in evolution called punctuated e equilibria. But what it basically means is uh, as one species um, experiences a change in conditions that is profound enough to make it very difficult for them to exist, other species that lived at the edge and were maybe struggling a little bit step in and take their place. And, and this happened because dinosaurs were super specialized. Yeah, they were really, really good at what they did. They existed for 150 million years, I think. And, you know, they were damn good. The plant eaters were really efficient plant eaters and, and the predators were really efficient predators. I wouldn't want to face a, a T-Rex. They were quite nasty. So uh, they were really, really good at what they did. But in the process of specialization, which often happens, um, they lost their agility. They, they lost the ability to operate when conditions change because they were very good at doing just one thing. Now, mammals, on the other hand, had spent many, many thousands, maybe many millions of years surviving on the edge, and they were getting the scraps. And because of that, they were small, but they were also agile. Uh, they, they, they didn't know where they were going to get their next meal from, so they, they could eat meat or they could eat um, plants or they could eat insects. They were, they, they, they were just sort of very, very flexible. And they survived at the edges because of that. But what happened is when the world changed, that ability to be flexible and agile and do lots of things turned into a huge advantage and they were able to survive when the dinosaurs didn't. So the answer um, in, in that case was that agility and that smallness became a major advantage. So rather than the giant T-Rex we saw at the beginning being the winner, a small little thing that looks a, a, a little bit like this guy was actually the winner in the evolutionary race. And the opportunity came from their agility. And, you know, I know a lot of people on this call are from medium sized and smaller companies. And I think this, this represents a huge opportunity because often smaller companies are agile. They're obviously smaller, but they're agile and they're used to sort of being flexible. And generally speaking, I won't go into it, but there's, there's um, Aaron Berg Bass laws of marketing, which says that markets favor big organizations because they are super efficient and, and for all sorts of reasons around um, mental availability. You know, it's very difficult to break into a big market, but a big change in context like this presents, presents a once in a lifetime opportunity for uh, smaller players who are agile and flexible to gain market share. And that's really what I want to explore today as an analogy. <laughs> Now, let me give you a, an example from Vegas. And this, this is um, a show in Vegas called Raiding the Rock Ball. And it's for, you know, I'm an old rocker, so this appeals to me. Um, this is a bunch of, of old rockers. I could call them dinosaurs, but they'd be really pissed at me, so I won't. Um, but, um, so hopefully none of them are on the call, and if you are, I'm sorry, guys. But, but th this show is one of the most successful in Vegas. It's been around for about 15 years, which is a very long time for a Vegas show. And it's routinely voted one of the top shows. And it's basically a bunch of old rockers who get together and play old rock songs. And, and people love it. Um, the problem is that since March, it's been closed. And they recently announced that it's not going to open again until at least 2021. And there's a real chance that it might not open at all. And the reason for that is it's quite big. It's got a large... Uh, group of performers. You know, Howard in the middle there, um, he he's, was the original guitarist with Heart and he currently plays with Bad Company. So he and all of his, his mates 
they, they're not cheap. They cost money to get, and they've got lighting crews, and they've got sound crews, and um, they've got a big stage and whatever. So they require a lot of resources to operate. And because of that, they just don't have the audience in which to survive. So, so they're in trouble. Now, a lot of the smaller uh, musicians in Vegas are starting to get work because they're more flexible. They can go out as one or two. They can play acoustically in a small restaurant and a bar. And, and that agility is allowing them to scrape a living when the bigger organizations can't. And Cirque du Soleil is facing a similar problem. Now, there is an exception to this. And, you know, the, the Lady Gargas of this world, and incidentally, that's not Lady Gaga, that's the wax model of Lady Gaga. I didn't want to pay for a picture of Lady Gaga, so that one's a lot cheaper. Um, but it looks good if I don't sell anyone. Um, I do actually have a picture of Aerosmith, that's a real one, because I was there. But, um, but you know, these guys, they can survive. They, they are the, the too big to fail format because you know Gaga can go and make a record or a movie for a year and come back so they do have the resources and big organizations do have that but you know that doesn't mean to say that um, they're not going to lose some share or not going to lose some following during that and that there's not an opportunity for smaller bands to, to make a, a, an impact now but how if you are small what is it you have to do to have a chance to, to get in and again I love analogies so I'm going to make a, a and I know Jivak and I first met when I was doing biomimicry, which is making analogies to, to nature. So I've got to dig back into nature to give an example. Um, but the key to, to flexibility is, the, the other word for flexibility when it comes to companies is, is innovation. It's the ability to come up with new stuff. And I like to give this example of Hydra. And Hydra is a small animal. It's a very small animal. It's a quite simple animal. Uh, but it's, it's unique for a couple of reasons. And one of those is it's immortal. So, you know, when I come back, maybe I want to come back as a Hydra. It's kind of a boring life as a Hydra, but, but, it's, but uh, it's quite a simple organism, but it's immortal. But the other thing about it is, um, maybe I want to come back for this reason. It has sex in two different ways. One way is when everything is good, when the environment around it is good and, and it's living well, if you like, it's got plenty to eat and the temperature's right, it buds. And you see that little thing on the top of it, that's the beginning of a bud. And what that means is it grows a little mini-me version of itself. And that small little mini-me version grows and it eventually separates out and it, it populates the, the pool in which it lives with lots of little mini-mini versions of itself, which are all identical. So it's not a very innovative creature at that point. But what it does, which is really fascinating for a geek like me, is that when conditions get rough, if food gets low, um, if the temperature starts to change, it actually starts to reproduce sexually rather than asexually and budding. And that's an interesting choice because when it's got less resources, it actually spends more resources because it's more expensive to uh, reproduce sexually. But the reason it does that is sexual reproduction is a proxy for innovation. And when you mix two gene pools, instead of getting lots of identical versions of yourself, you get a variety of versions which are somewhat related to you. And that, that's a fascinating concept because um, then you know, some of them will lose, some of them will be worse than the original, but the, what evolution has shown is that some of them will be sufficiently different that they survive better in a new environment. And, and this, this is an important analogy because I think when we face a crisis, one of the, one of our, I, and I'm a, you know, into psychology, one of the things that we tend to do is buckle down the hatches and, and you know, cost save and try and, uh, try and avoid doing anything because we've got limited resources. But I'd argue that often the answer is to be like Hydra. And when things get tough, the most important thing we can do is innovate because the world's changing. And if you don't change, um, the chances are that when it all ends, when it all ends, you may have cost saved, you may have been careful, but the world's going to be sufficiently different that you may no, longer, may no longer be relevant. So it's a case of getting the balance right, but, but it is important to keep innovating during a crisis. But that means change. And the, you know, the problem with change uh, is that it's difficult. And the psychology of change is fascinating, actually. Now, you know, I, I suspect a lot of people on this talk um, our change agents, designers, innovators. We all like change and we, we all like leading change. So, yeah, that's the job we've chosen. So, you know, um, to say we're against change would be like that. But, but actually, even, even we are, because there's two fundamental differences, I think, between what's happening at the moment and when we lead change. And one is, it's in that word leading change. There's a huge difference between, between being a change agent 
and trying to push change or trying to develop change or being at the front and having change dumped on you. If I you know, take the example of being a dinosaur, being a dinosaur when that meteor landed, um, if you were a change agent dinosaur, which is a bit unlikely, um, but being a change agent doesn't prepare you for having a, a huge hot meteor land on your head. It's still an unpleasant experience. So, you know, having change forced on you is, is different to, to trying to lead it. And the other thing is that even when we're leading change, we like anchors. We, we like to change things, but you don't want everything to change at once. You know, the last thing you really want is to be leading a huge project at the same time that you're moving your office and the economy is tanking and all sorts of things are going on. We can only process so much. So change is good, but change in sort of discrete areas is good. When the whole world changes and it falls from under you, it's difficult. And that's to some extent what we're facing at the moment. But um, you know, even if we feel bad about change, as this poor polar bear does at the moment, um, change is also a potential opportunity, and it's the opportunity side I, I really want to talk about. Now, to get into that, I promised I would talk about uh, psychology, and again, I, I've been doing applied psychology and innovation for about 15 years, and when I first started, not a lot of people had really engaged in this. It's become a lot more popular now and a lot more mainstream. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this, but I'll just touch on it to get everybody up to speed. But, you know, I'm going to refer back to Dan Kahneman's work, Thinking Fast and Slow, that he got the Nobel Prize for. And if you haven't worked it out by now, I, I like analogies. So I used an analogy of a, an iceberg. And this is a great way for me of thinking about how Dan describes how humans think. And we kind of have two thinking processes that work in parallel. One is a conscious system, which he calls um, system one. And that, and that is this, is the decisions that you're aware of. GVAC, you were talking about going to the fridge. And when you go into the fridge, deciding whether you're going to have chocolate or cheese, um, you know, to some extent, you're, you're aware of that. Um, so it's a conscious thinking process. But the thing with that is we can only think about one thing at once. I mean, even when people talk about multitasking, all they're really doing is, is flipping between two things things they're thinking about. You literally can't think about two things at the same time. Try it. It's really, really hard. Um, but we have another part of our brain which operates unconsciously. And that part of your brain is much more efficient, much faster, and um, it, it, it actually dominates a lot of what we do. So you may have heard never go shopping when you're hungry, because if you go shopping when you're hungry, you buy about 20% more calories. And that's not because you consciously think I'm hungry, so I'm gonna go and buy a sweet or salty snack. It's just that your unconscious mind um, takes over and drives behavior without you realizing it. Um, a good example of this is driving. When you first learn to drive, it's a very thoughtful process. You've got to think about looking in the mirror and other cars and when to change gear and when to steer and whatever. Well, that was very British changing gear, but, but you get the idea. Um, but then as you get used to it, as it becomes a habit, you can, you can then drive without thinking about it and you can hold a conversation and you can listen to the radio. And you absolutely shouldn't, but some people can talk on their phones or text. And that's because it's, it's, it's become an automatic process and you can do multiple ones of those at, at any one time. Um, now, why is that important? Well, that, well that, first of all, it's a bit unintuitive. So anyone who's not um, seen this before, um, it's like, well, you know, is my unconscious really that powerful? Well, often your unconscious is actually more powerful than your conscious. And let me give you an example of that. And I don't know if you can see this, but if uh, I could uh, stop sharing and just put this on. So this is a, an example of it. And as you can see, there's two tables there. And one of them looks like it's kind of short and squat. And one of them looks like it's long and thin. You see that? But if I do that, and put that over that and then flip it and put that over that you can see that they're actually identical but then when i take that away again that one still looks short and squat and that one looks short and thin now what does that what does that tell us let me share screen again hang on we back it tells us you're a magician I'm sorry. <laughs> what that shows us is that our unconscious mind often dominates our conscious mind. So in that case, we know 
uh, our intelligent smart conscious mind knows that those two tables are the same shape but interestingly what um what happens is our unconscious is dominating. So even when our, our, our smart, conscious, thoughtful mind knows that they are actually the same, they still look different to us because our unconscious dominates. Now I've got to find a way to get back to... Um, presentation mode. Yep, got okay, it. Cool. Okay. So that's that bit. So, and this is really key to the rest of what I'm going to talk about. Now you may say, well, okay, that's a little parlor trick. It's a little illusion. So what? Let me give you an example of that operating in the real world. And this is some data from some um, uh, probation judges in Israel. So this is real world data and it's, it's from an academic paper. So it's got all sorts of weird shit on it, like ordinal position and whatever. But what this actually shows is a bunch of um, pr probation um, judges offering probation to people and it's data collected over about three months i think and what uh, on the left hand side it's the percentage of people they offer probation to and on the right hand or, or the, the lower thing is time and what happens is at eight o'clock in the morning when they start they offer probation to about 70 percent of people and as the morning goes through by lunchtime they're offering it to nobody then they go off, have a cup of coffee, lunch, get caloried up and caffeined up. Then they offer probation to about 70% of people again. It then drops to close to zero. And in the afternoon, they have a cup of coffee and a biscuit. It goes up again, but quickly drops. Now, what does this tell us about probation? But it tells, tells us that if we're ever up for probation, try and get the first slot in the morning or the first slot in the afternoon. Um, assuming nobody on this call is going to face that situation, what's going on? Well, it turns out that if you're a judge, the hard thing to do is to give someone probation. That's the one you've got to think about. Because if you don't offer probation, if you just send someone back, then it doesn't do any real harm. It hurts the person potentially who is up for probation, but you know, all they're doing is finishing their sentence. So, you know, it's tough on them, but it doesn't do a huge, any huge damage to society as a whole. Conversely, if you release someone on probation and they go off and murder, rape or steal from someone, that has a huge impact on society. And by the way, um, the judges ask gets kicked for it later because people come back and say, why did you do that? So it requires more thought to offer probation than not. Um, we call it ego depletion because that means the decision to offer probation is that conscious thinking part of the brain that operates above the waterline for the iceberg. Uh, the sort of non-decision to send them back is a largely automatic response, which is the stuff operating below the waterline. And what happens, unbeknown to the judges, is at the start of the day, they're using that part of their brain above the waterline. And by, by the end, by lunchtime, they've exhausted that because it's a limited resource. So they're just sending people back automatically. Um, so it shows that even with professional decision makers, this unconscious can dominate their decisions and their behaviors, even when we don't realize it does. And this has important implications for us all over the place, not least of which is next time you want to catch your boss late on a Friday afternoon to so, you, know, you just catch him walking into the parking lot and you think it's a great idea to sell him on this idea. You might want to think about it because if it's something that they've got to actually put a lot of thinking into, they're going to be at this bit right at the bottom right where they don't have by Friday afternoon, they don't have the mental power to deal with this. So actually timing of getting people to make decisions is super important. But when it comes to this idea of, of um, innovating, and especially innovating in a time of crisis like COVID, um, we've got, well, it's interesting, we've got two conflicting effects happening. And this often happens in psychology. Um, you see a lot of stuff in the literature where people run lab experiments and they show a single effect but the reality is is the real world rarely has single effects it usually has lots of things that are impacting our decisions and two things are happening one is pushing us above the waterline and one is and some are pushing us below what's pushing us above and this is the huge opportunity for us that i get quite excited about is all sorts of habits have broken and all sorts of new skills have been learned by people. So, you know, big brands and loyalty really depends on habits a lot of the time. People go into a supermarket and they buy Tide because they've always bought Tide. And it's not because they're deeply analyzing the value of Tide, it's just because it's the easy thing to do. But if they're no longer going into a supermarket and having to um, buy online, for example, um, a lot of the cues that drove them 
to do that have disappeared. So it opens a window for them to think, and when people think, they change, and that's an opportunity for innovation. Conversely, there's a lot of stuff that's shrinking our ability to think. Stress actually makes it harder to think. So the bit above the waterline is shrinking. Um, we're more afraid of losing stuff than gaining it. So that's, that's shrinking because change is a, a chance to lose. Um, flights of the familiar one, that's one of the things that when things get difficult, we've seen this again and again, people get nostalgic and want to go back to stuff like it was before. So as this crisis starts to break out, we're going to see people wanting to go back. And that's important because we're in a transition spot at the moment and it's difficult to innovate in a transition because we don't, there's a lot of stuff about new normal. We really don't know where we're going to end up or how quickly. So we need to innovate at the moment, but we need to innovate with agility and flexibility because no one's really sure how all of this is going to pan out. Um, and there's another thing called mirror exposure where we actually just like things because they're familiar, but I, I won't get into that in any detail. Um, but this brings to an important point. I, I'm fascinated by behavioral science and psychology, but you know, you've got to understand that this, this, is, this is not physics. This is a, um, a social science or, or a behavioral science. So it helps us understand systems like that. It helps us understand what questions to ask, but it doesn't provide concrete decisions. So we can use psychology to know what we should be asking and what we should be thinking. But you, you, we still have to experiment. And that, that's really important. So I sometimes get people say, well, you know, what, what would psychology tell you? And then they go and act on that. You've, got to, you've still got to experiment because this never really tells you for certain what's going on. It just gives you better guidance for thinking. But I do think this represents a massive opportunity. But if you look at the structure of, of how we think and you know, the importance of that bit above the waterline to change, I don't know why this keeps jumping. Um, you know, as that's shrinking, the key thing is that we need to innovate in ways which is cognitively fluid. In other words, it needs to be simple. This is not a time to be giving people complex, difficult, really cool new ideas. This is a time to give people new stuff that is simple and easy. Um, it needs to be stuff that, you know, analogies are great. If you, if you can give some, someone something which is similar to something they already know, that's great. If you can give someone something that they can, they can sort of intuitively understand, that's great. But this is not a time to give them complex new ideas because they don't have the mental capacity to deal with it and they don't have the motivation to deal with it. So it's a great opportunity for innovation, but it's an opportunity for intuitive and simple innovation. As I've already said, broken habits, you know, we've never had as many broken habits. So the window of opportunity is huge. And the risk to established businesses is unprecedented. Um, so it, it's a great time. Um, and, and again, I've, I've talked about this, but, um, you know, the world has changed and context is so, so important for behavior. Uh, virtually everything we do is, is driven by context. Um, when we go into a supermarket, um, our memories, we, we have massive amount of memories. We may think that our memory is, is failing as we get older. It's not, it's just we've got more and more and we can only think of one at a time. But what we think of is usually triggered by context. And, you know, so um, when, when we walk into a supermarket, it triggers all sorts of behavior. If we usually shop online, the process of going into the Amazon website triggers past experiences which have worked for us, and that triggers our choices to some extent. It narrows them down. Um, with COVID, so much of the context which normally would drive behavior has disappeared that it's a huge window for us to introduce new but simple ideas. Um, and to that point, as this is something which are, as industrial designers, a lot of people will be familiar with in body cognition. Um, a lot of people would have read Dan Norman stuff, but this is a great example for me of intuitive design or innovation with a low cognitive barrier. You know, the idea that when you see a handle, you grab it. You don't have to think about that. This is all operating below the waterline with that iceberg. You don't have to sort of um, think deeply about whether to pull a handle. You just do it without thinking. Um, so building um, intuitive elements into designs wherever as possible minimizes the amount of cognitive effort people have got to do. And this all comes down to just tapping into um, what people have seen before. I always loved it's old. Probably a lot of people in here are not old enough to remember this, but the old Canon um, thing of so advanced it's simple. You know, when we were going through a process where technology was getting more and more complex and 
you know, the, the TV remote, which still baffles me. I've still got probably 40 buttons on my TV remote that I have absolutely no idea what they do. Um, technology should make it simple. Voice control, which says on, is so much simpler than going through 50 buttons and working out what to do. So this is really a window of opportunity for intuitive and simple design and innovation. Um, but I do want to just mention one other thing which I think is critical and it's so big in, in cognitive psychology and that is revenge. Um, and this is a, a period of time where um, we've got to be so careful about this if you're an established business. And, um, you know, first of all, well, what is revenge? Well, revenge is nature's police force. Um, why do people have this revenge tendency? It's because when we, our brains developed as hunter-gatherers, um, we didn't have a police force in our villages or our, our farms or our caves. So we policed ourselves. And revenge is the way we police ourselves. So if you imagine, supposing we, we evolve with a non-revenge um, type of mindset, whereas if someone did something, an eye for an eye, which with the lady there is an appropriate um, terminology, she's got a patch. But if someone came and stole my chicken, if the only thing I was ever gonna do is go back and steal a chicken back from them, then it's actually worth their while doing that because if there's a chance I won't catch them, um, the act of aggression or the act of theft would actually, the odds of it would come out in their favor. We, we evolve revenge because um, if someone is gonna come and steal my chicken, and in response, instead of going and stealing one back, I'm gonna hit them over the head with a rock, um, the cost of, of, of being caught exceeds the benefit. And the important thing with that is, it means that um, it, it, the risk involved in upsetting someone or doing something bad to someone, um, the response to it is disproportionate. And why is that important? Well, if I look at all of the, the stuff that's going on at the moment, a lot of companies are struggling. We've got cash flow struggles. We've got, um, I look at the airline industry. I've run into this. I won't mention the company, but trying to get a refund from an airline at the moment is like extracting um, blood from a stone. It's really difficult. The problem with that is, if people are treating their companies are treating their customers like that, revenge kicks in. And not only will people maybe not use them again for a while, they'll not use them ever. And they'll also tell 20 of their friends. So this is an, but for those companies, again, in terms of opportunity, if you're operating in a business where companies are treating people badly, it's a massive opportunity to steal market share. So um, that's it. Oops. My things keep going forward, but uh, any questions, any thoughts? Oh, that um, is absolutely amazing, uh, Pete. Means I do not know where to start asking questions or where to uh, uh, look for other element. That was that was fascinating. It's means I always knew uh, you are an amazing, passionate speaker. But that the passion, your love for the entire elements, uh, is is really evident uh, as such. So. It's, it's amazing, the psychology of the use of a product, but before that comes the psychology of a buy. Uh, like, how are people thinking and what's changing? Uh, as such, there are uh, so many elements. I just need to just point them out. The, the picture of the runner you showed, that was you when you were young, right? With the mohawk? Uh, no, it wasn't. That was just a... Uh, um... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, it was my brother. <laughs> interesting about that. I did not knew Cirque du Soleil. Uh, file for bankruptcy. It, it's one of the best shows. We typically I have not seen all of them, but most of them. It's let's see how how it evolves. And you're right, uh, they might come back in a completely different manifestation also. And that's where the innovation world lies in in in, in treating. I think one of the underlining things that you're saying is uh, that we also sell from the world of design is design is uh, is an investment. It is not an insurance. People always think about it like, yeah, well, no, it, it's not that kind of an element. You have to start investing into it. And uh, you talked about cash flow. You talked about uh, the long-term needs also. That investment has to be on the same similar percentage in, in the cash flow, cash flow areas and also in the long-term areas too. That's, that, that's, that's pretty interesting uh, as such. I, uh, you I, would meant, say if you, I, I would say that you get more return on your buck now because a lot of people are contracting and not investing. So, you know, it's like marketing. If people pull away from marketing, you can get more marketing space if you invest now than you would at a normal time. And it's the same for innovation. So this is actually, if you've got the resources, 
th this is an opportunity for disproportionate return on your investment. Yeah, it's and disproportionate is, is the exact word. Uh, you mentioned uh, in, in the earlier after the dinosaurs, uh, you curve, and maybe I wrote it wrong. You said experiences are changing the conditions or is the other way around? Because the conditions made who, uh, who we are, and that's perfectly uh, intuitive. But are you saying now our newer behavior experiences are going to uh, reflect the conditions also? Or did I no, I, maybe I said that wrong. The, the context changes our behavior. Um, yeah. Now, of course, but our, our, our behavior, what happens to us has impacts on other parts of the system. So that's, it's, it's a network, you know, um, as companies go bust or as people stop spending, then that obviously has knock on effects on the rest of the system. So it's, um, we as individuals are impacted by the context, but then our behavior um, has impacts that spread out across the entire network. So I think that's the way I look. And, and, and the element is uh, basically about, we talked about agility and the context means that that's, that's amazing means culture and the context, they all mold who we are. And then as we are designing the next set of products and utilities on utensils and equipment for them, this might be a loaded question, uh, but uh, just as culture forces the product uh, when it is designed, can the product and its intended behaviors force a culture change or that's, impossible um i think i think products can drive culture change um uh, you know, if, you, if you look at um if products if products drive behavior if they're successful they, they can drive culture change so if, if you look at you know amazon will be a classic example if you look at amazon as a product i mean it's a service but but if you look at that as a product um that has massively changed behavior because it's driven people away from bricks and mortar and um, into, um, into a virtual world. And of course, that has had knock-on effects as we go through this, as people have been forced into a virtual world. So, uh, and you know, I, I think products overall change behaviors as you add convenience to things, um, you know, television, video, streaming services, um, you know, they, they are changing behavior. Streaming services is pulling people away from the movie theaters and pulling them back into their homes. So a lot of um, product change is actually driving, it's, it's ironic in that COVID-19 has pulled us into our homes, but a lot of um, products and services were doing that already. So it, it may have just accelerated something which was naturally happening. But I do think there's a watch out for us as designers and innovators in this, and that is, uh, if I go back to my, my favorite subject of analogy, which is, you know, one of the ways we come up with new ideas, it, you, don't, you don't get new ideas by looking at, at things which are extremely similar to, to the problems we're facing. We get new ideas primarily by looking at analogies. We may do that unconsciously or we may do it consciously. But, you know, a lot of great inv inventions, um, punch cards came from, uh, for computers, came from the punch cards in um, weaving looms. Um, Surgical suturing came from someone who was uh, an expert in embroidery. So we often innovations either consciously or unconsciously come from exposure to things that are outside your normal area of experience. The problem that I think we, we face at the moment is we're all sitting in our living rooms or our spare rooms or our spare bedrooms and we're not having the sort of serendipitous interactions with other people. Um, a lot of connection to things that are outside our normal range come from the water cooler or the elevator or the bus stop or the um, train or, um, or, or the movie theater or whatever, where we meet other people. And we're getting starved of that. So one of the dangers long-term is that we risk becoming less creative because we've got less exposure to new information. Now we can consciously fight that, we can watch more public television, we can read more, we can, um, so to some extent we can offset that, but it does require a conscious effort to some extent. And I think eventually, you know, this idea that we may all end up just working from home is a terrifying idea for innovation and design because we need that physical interaction and that serendipity of, um, of interaction. It doesn't mean to say we have to go back to exactly where we were, but I do think we need, we need to go back part of the way. Otherwise we risk actually slowing down our creativity. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that right now, what you said about the explorations and trying to make sure you connect outside your uh, zone, going into the analogous market is exactly uh, what any design studio should be doing. It might be external or it might be internal to a company too. One amazing element you said about the, the big dinosaur killers, it eventually the future belong to the smaller uh, mammals. And that's why we are here as compared to them. Uh, when you said about the smaller player, that completely makes sense. Does it also make sense now the smaller markets also? Uh, means earlier it was moms and pop stores. I'm making huge jumps here. Moms yeah. and pop stores, they were dis dislodged by uh, Walmarts and Kmarts. Or when you say about smaller players, can also it be smaller locality kind of an influence businesses might have a little bit more uh, uh, forces behind them? That's a great question, and uh, the short answer is I, I don't know the answer. I think it's the, the model I have is for a small entity to make inroads on a big entity, it's got to do something better than that big entity. So its size has got to allow it to do something. So if I was a mum and pop store, mum and pop store, mum and pop store, that's obviously for pet food, but a mum and pop store. Um, if I, if I wanted to make inroads into Walmart at this point, then I would, I would want to find something that I can do that Walmart can't. So maybe it will be increased safety at this moment in time. Maybe it will be the ability to put together packages. I don't know, but you've, but it, the size has to, the small size has to come with an agility and an ability to offer something that the big entity can't. So it's really just a case on a, on a, Category, category by category or business by business basis to look at what what does this allow me to do you know it, it's like um, a small boat and a big boat you know a big oil tanker is much more difficult for it to turn uh, a small boat can turn more quickly so what can I do as a small entity that that a you know a big entity is committed and can't change but I I can um, Retail is a tough one because the big ones have some massive, massive advantages of scale. So they're more Lady Gaga's. But, yeah. you know, I, I think every business, if you know your business, look for things that you can do because you're smaller. Yeah. And by the way, uh, I know you cannot, you could not take a selfie with Lady Gaga. I can always, you can take a selfie with me next time you meet. So thank you. Uh, you're, you're much prettier than Lady Gaga. Uh, uh, there are a couple of questions here too uh, from, uh, I, I hope I'm going to pronounce the name correctly, Hedron. Uh, is there an opportunity for green thinking, uh, means agile companies, to unseat this fossil fuel uh, dinosaurs? Yeah, um, which is ironic when you think that. Um, uh, fossil fuels actually come from dinosaurs, um, but uh, or at least um, the plants that were around for them. I, I, I think that yes, there is. I mean, when it, this is an opportunity for change, um, so that change can, um, if we can come up with during this period of time, if smaller companies can come up with viable alternatives when people are more open to change, it represents an unprecedented opportunity to drive that change. Um, two things to be careful of. One is that don't innovate for now, innovate or, or stay flexible enough um, that we're innovating and bringing products for where we're going to be. Um, you know, the danger is that the, at the moment people are at home, maybe have more time to think about that stuff. But then when all of this finishes, they immediately jump back to their old habits. So we've got to find if, if we're going to if we're going to take advantage of it to change behavior make sure that we're, we're changing the behavior in a way that's, that's sustainable in, in that context. But I do think that the fact that people's minds are more open to change because their habits have been broken, it does represent an, an, an unprecedented opportunity for, for big change. Especially when you're uh, saying about the, the change, the behavioral change means, uh, how, how have you helped companies who can, or who are change averse, right? Means there will be some resistance from some of those companies or those folks how do, you, how do you help individuals or companies overcome this initial barrier itself? Is that an easy task? Um, it depends. Um, as a consultant, when I come, come in, and I was an internal consultant in PNG long before I was an external consultant, um, real change usually comes from passion and it comes from individuals. Um, it, it, 
you know, there's always inertia. The bigger the company, the more inertia there is. There's more people sitting there who've been doing the same thing for the last 20 years and they've been successful at doing it. So it's, it's harder to get large groups of people to change. But I, I've usually found that the change comes from finding a few individuals who are deeply passionate and also know how to navigate their way through an organization. I mean, being a change agent from outside an organization is super difficult because you don't know the internal politics. You don't know who the real decision makers are. I mean, often, you know, you may think, well, the CEO is the decision maker. I mean, often it's the CEO's advisor who is the decision maker. You know, in P&G during AG Lafley times, um, Roger Martin had a massive amount of influence. He didn't even work at P&G. Um, so knowing the structure, so having insiders, but having insiders who are deeply passionate about change is, is a really important way of driving change in big organizations with inertia. Um, so the hard thing is, is finding those people within an organization who have that passion. And that's where I think things like gets back to physical interactions, you know, conferences, interactions outside of a, a, a business are important for finding that person who's got a deep passion for something. Uh, that's absolutely good. I, was just, I, have, I have many questions and many questions will, will be left answered. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, you talking about the ego depletion. Uh, it might be with a probation or, or anywhere else. So you are saying there is always, what is a good time to have client meetings then? When we want to sell some big project to somebody, what, what is that sweet spot then? Um, well, I mean, one of the things that I think we do consistently wrong um, is that we, we saved a big sell to the end, right? So um, if you look at that diagram, the longer you've been um, in a discussion, um, the less open people are to new ideas. And what's the typical structure of a meeting? It's to start off with all of your persuasion and reasons and whatever. And at the end of two hours, you come and say, so now we want you to make this decision. And you're doing it at exactly the wrong time when they're, they're, they're sort of primed to say, oh no. Um, so we, so, you know, actually one of the things I used to do is I go through the cell and then I, I'd say, let's take a break. And um, we'd either go for lunch or we'd grab coffee and we'd have a, and then, then I'd go into the cell immediately afterwards because you're back up at that point where people are more open to it. So, you know, th this has real implications. Now, does it get, does that help you sell a shitty idea? No, of course not. But um, don't make it harder for the people you're selling to, um, to buy your idea than is necessary. And our typical meeting structure does exactly that, which I think is kind of funny, but we just don't realize yeah, you, and, and not only that, it also about what we eat means we had done, let's say, our own A-B testing when we have, we, we used to have literally till six months ago, uh, our own uh, innovation days and, and a small group of people uh, coming in the studio for our uh, lunch and learns as such. And uh, when we had pauses like this, we used to have, uh, a, let's say, fruit tray and also a donut tray and guess what people went for. And it is unusual to see, we all think, we all understand, we talk about it every day, about obesity and things like that, but finally during those things, it's first the donuts uh, and the eclairs uh, get literally finished up. And then maybe somebody just grabs one to put them in their purse or bag. So it's, it's amazing even what we choose and how we, may help in that sugar rise or sugar crash and all those things as such. I, I know we are decently over time, uh, but I think we can, uh, we should, we have to pause this sometime uh, and then jump over to, uh, to the next, next speaker. Uh, is, is there, is there just to, not to close out as such, but uh, what would be like one amazing piece of advice you like to give to the product managers or the product uh, uh, directors at big companies right now. So we talked about agility, smallness, uh, startups, entrepreneurs, kind of and medium-sized companies. What should some of the managers in big dinosaur uh, companies, how should they try to think or pivot? Um, put me on the spot, but I, I, actually what I would say to them is, you're more vulnerable than you realize. Um, now is your opportunity to invest in innovation. You're probably under enormous pressure to cost save and to prepare for a recession, but now is the opportunity to actually invest because big companies, um, it's like hibernating. They, they have the fat that they can live off, but when, when things come out of this, um, 
they actually have more opportunity to to invest than a lot of small companies and they're more vulnerable because the habits that drive and protect their businesses are breaking down so for big companies my advice would be act like a small company at this moment in time and invest in marketing invest in innovation and use this as a, a period of time where you're going to get more bang for your buck um, and you can potentially grow but you've got to, you've got to act small to be bigger and that, that, that's fantastic and maybe on, on just on on the uh, as you go you had an amazing background in chemistry how did you pivot yourself to be so passionate in the behavioral science what 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 was that turning point for you personally uh, in your life journey uh short attention span is the um <laughs> I thought you would say uh, rock and roll, sex and drugs, but no, it's it's just short attention spans. That's okay. No, no that's just been consistent across all of it. But, um, but uh, <laughs> no, I just get bored easy. I went from musician to artist to chemist to psychologist to photographer. I, I just get bored easy. No, no that, that's the word. I mean, musicians, artistry, uh, and now innovation thinker, that's pretty good. Thank you once again, Pete. Uh, if we get any specific questions for you, we will direct them towards uh, your perspective. But as always, you always present a complete different palette of thoughts to think about uh, and go back and try to see how we can apply that to that to our, our workplace, our home place, uh, our uh, play place and all those things. So thank you once again. Feel free to uh, uh, unmute and uh, let's say unvideo yourself, not unmute, mute and unvideo yourself and feel free to be on for the rest of the speakers. Uh, I, I see uh, Carla there. So uh, after one or two minutes, I will request her to come on the stage and see you around, sir. Thank you once again. So once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that was Pete, and it's 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 amazing to understand the context we are in, right? Means the second or third slide about behavioral science, uh, the evolutionary science, uh, the commercial kind of and uh, vectors, uh, the product design vectors. We are all so interconnected of what we think, what already we have in our mental models, what what confirmation biases we all come with, with our upbringing, uh, with our uh, society, with our culture, it might be different geographical uh, elements too. It's human mind is a, a mess in a good way and then trying to figure it out and then try to put out in a product form or an interface form or a service form is, is fun but it's challenging too. So uh, we will be, in a couple of minutes, we'll be inviting uh, Carla on the stage. One thing that uh, Pete showed, uh, that image, if you remember, of an, uh, a Spanish girl fighting with this uh, eye patch. I do not know if you know about the eye patch. I do not know about the fencing tournament over there. But eye patches, we always associate that with pirates and maybe uh, the other elements in the pirate world too. But most of the pirate people uh, would have an eye patch. So the main part is, the backstory is, they are necessarily not blind in that eye. See, one of the things, or at least they're called the runners, uh, or there might be different derivations of that, uh, all the cannonballs were saved all the way down in the, in the lowest form, in the lowest keel of the boat, right? For, for the uh, boat to balance or the ship to balance as such. And when you are fighting or you are shooting uh, cannonballs, your runner will go all the way from the deck all the way down, get the cannonballs, run all the way up. Typically, outside, it's plain ocean, huge sunlight, and you know what happens when you are exposed to sunlight and you immediately go into a dark area, it becomes more darker. It's all because of the contrast element as such. So the reason they had that eye patch is when you are out on the sea, uh, you are still getting only one eye exposed and dilated as such. And when you actually want to go down inside in the darkness, at that time you open this eye and suddenly you literally, I don't know exact percentage, but it literally increases your ability to see and feel in, in that darkness over there too. So it was designed uh, for a pure function, not just as an aesthetical or a non-aesthetical element too. I do not, don't ask me why I know more about pirates, but it's always nice to understand the backstories, right? Why something is happening and what, what were the forces for it to happen at that time? And that's what I think any or each designer would do. 